Good afternoon. My name is Dave Burton, and I am the, the mayor of the Municipality of Highlands East and on the Ontario Good Roads Association Board of Directors. Shauna Lukowicz is a professor at, at the King's College at the University of Western University in London. She is widely recognized as an expert in social justice and community organizing. As a founder of Women and Politics, a London grassroots organization that engages diverse women with politics and issues that impact their lives, Shauna has become a strong voice intent on making our governments more inclusive. Last fall, Shauna walked the Ontario Good Roads Association board through an exercise to better help us understand the positive impact of applying a gender and diversity lens to our work. Today she is here to show us how your community can benefit from this approach. Please welcome Shauna. Well, that was a nice introduction. Thank you very much. Um, so in addition to what you just heard, um, I want to tell you three things about myself. Um, the th three things that I'm most passionate about about our gender, justice, and great cities. And those are the things that I'm gonna to talk to you about for the next 10 minutes. And I'm gonna start by saying something that I don't think is all that controversial, and that is that the world is not an equal place for everyone. That some people are given advantages that others miss out on, and therefore life is harder for some people than for others. For example, we know that women make 87 cents for every dollar a man makes, and that women who are racialized disabled or trans make even less. We know that men make up the largest portion of the population that are homeless, and that indigenous men are overrepresented in the population. We know that one in three women will experience sexual assault in their lifetime, while pretty much all women will experience some form of sexual harassment at some point, and that women with disabilities are particularly at risk for sexual assault. We know that newcomers have difficulty finding work despite having higher level degrees and experience. So if we can agree that the world is not an equal place for everyone, we can also agree that this shows up in our towns, our cities, and our communities. But beyond inequality, people just use spaces differently. And this can show up in many ways. It shows up when women feel less safe in parking lots, that are secluded in the backs of buildings or underground. It shows up in the reality that women take transit more often than men, and the parallel to this, that men drive more often. It shows up in the tendency for boys to spend more time on playground and equipment, and that youth are more likely to access public spaces that they can easily walk to. That newcomers are more likely to work further away from their homes, while women, the elderly, and people with disabilities are more likely to be impacted when sidewalks aren't shoveled and bus stops aren't cleared. But these differences aren't just about choices. They are the result of the way that we design our community, the policies we implement, the infrastructure we build, the services we offer, and how we offer them. These differences are not inevitable, but instead the result of any number of decisions that each of us make along the way. We can create parks where all kids regularly use the playground equipment, where sidewalks and streets are read readily accessible to all, and that encourages active, transport active mobility for all people, where roads, parking lots, and transit meet the needs of everyone. How people use a city, a town, or a community varies, and some of this variation is the result of socialized factors that are reinforced in the decisions and policies and the built forms of our community. Unintentionally, we make these decisions that favor some people over others. But that's not the intention of planners. It's not the intention of city managers, managers, elected officials, engineers, or probably anyone in this room. The intention is to build communities that work for everyone. But that's difficult, and it's difficult when we don't have the data, the processes, or the policies to consider how our decisions are impacting people. This assumption has been that the decisions are neutral, so they'll impact people in the same way. And this means that we often don't collect disaggregated dat data based on gender, ethnicity, race, age, socioeconomic factors, etc. And without this data, it is hard to know if and how our decisions are impacting people in different ways. 
but the good news is that there are tools that can help communities build infrastructure, services, and economic opportunities for all. Tools like gender and equity analysis. So what's this analysis and how does it work? Uh, it's a decision-making process that considers the impact that policies, programs, and decisions have on men, women, and all genders, while also considering race, age, ability, sexual orientation, and other dimensions of diversity. Done well, it does necessitate the collection of disaggregated data so that the impact can be measured and adjustments can be made. It also calls for different questions to be asked, deeper research to be undertaken, and the inclusion of voices and perspectives not always captured. So a few examples of places that are using a gender and equity analysis in their work. In Montreal, to address public safety and violence against women, its Women, women in City program advocated for the building of new metro stations that were surrounded by glass so that women could be more easily seen while waiting for buses. The City of Vienna, well known for its uh, gender policies, created residential buildings that have courtyards and neighborhoods that better integrate work and home life, recognizing that women still carry the load of domestic responsibilities, yet are also active in the workforce. They knew that neighborhood design should reflect this reality. And our own federal government, just a little bit of time later today, will be tabling a budget today that, it, that includes a gender analysis, recognizing that connecting financial decisions to gender equality will move the needle forward on women's issues. So these are just a few examples. And I'm gonna take you very quickly uh, th through a simplified version of what the process might look like um, when somebody's doing a gender or an equity analysis. So first we ask, what's the issue or the decision that I'm making? And for our purposes today, let's say we're building a park, a park that's meant to attract families and people in the surrounding neighborhood, a gathering place for community, a place to be actives, active and perhaps even experience cultural events such as arts or music. Next, I'm gonna ask, what are my assumptions about this place that I'm building? Do I assume that it's easy to build parks that meet the needs of everyone by doing what I've always done? That standard playground equipment will attract all children that families, including newcomers and people with disabilities, will come if we put in a few picnic tables scattered throughout the park with a few trees. But most importantly, I challenge any assumption that I make, and I start to ask different questions. What am I not seeing? What am I not asking? And who am I not asking? And I also do data collection, disaggregated data collection. I ask who is actually using our parks and who isn't. And what does that breakdown look like in terms of gender and other factors? How does this compare to the actual demographics of the community where we're putting this park? I invite stakeholders to the table to tell us what they want for this park, and I make sure that unusual suspects are included at that table, that different questions are asked. And then I do research, and research beyond the box of what I would normally undertake, making sure that equity questions are incorporated into my research design. Next, I develop the policy, the program, or the event that I'm doing, and I do so with the understanding of what I have learned from the above. In putting forward a recommendation, I clearly demonstrate how gender and equity have impacted the decisions that I'm making, that I know who will most benefit from the de decision that we are doing and why it is important that they do. And after we implement, we evaluate, monitoring the progress to see if it is having the intended impact. And then we use that information to inform the next decisions that we make. So I get it, and I know that this seems like a lot of work uh, for staff, councils, and organizations that already have heavy loads. Um, so why do it? Why add another layer to your processes? Why add a gender and equity analysis to your heavy workloads? Um, so the decisions that governments, organizations, and businesses make will actually have a greater impact when a gender and equity analysis is undertaken because you can better see how the decisions you are making impact various people and you can target them. If you're building a road, you'll know who you're building that road for. You'll know that changing your sidewalk clearing bylaw will make it easier 
perhaps make it easier for women, elderly, and people with disabilities to get out and be more active in their communities. You'll understand who uses transit and who you are building transit for in the future. If a neighborhood faces disproportionate poverty, you'll be better able to address it in your community. If you need to attract more employment, you'll be better able to target economic initiatives to those who need it most. A gender inequity analysis also makes for greater investments of our tax dollars and funding in general. You're better able to use the money in the ways that make the most difference for those who need it. We know there's no sense in building a park that doesn't meet the needs of a community. We know that infrastructure needs to reflect, reflect its users. We need to use our money and our tax base in the most efficient way possible. And so more information leads to more economical decisions. Gender inequity analysis also aligns with best practices. Governments, agencies, organizations, and businesses around the world are using it. Our federal government is using it. The United Nations is using it. 28 countries in Europe use it. Many investment firms are now using it. And several cities and towns are as well, including the City of London. The City of London made a commitment to considering the use of a gender lens in new policies, programs, and decisions, making as part of its 2015-2019 strategic plan. It also recently added the use of an equity lens to its decision-making process. All of this is part of the City's ongoing commitment to creating a more inclusive and welcoming community. It is a recognition that we get there through deliberate decision-making and data, and unfortunately, not just by luck alone. So now we know a little bit about what it is, it's important to talk about what it isn't. It's not a perfect tool that on its own will fully, fully address inequities. It is one tool among many that needs to be implemented to change our structures. It is also just one tool that governments or organizations would use to make any decision. And the, the, there are many more factors that would go into making any decision. It's also not primarily a human resources tool. This is not about getting more diversity in organizations. It's something that's used throughout a government or an organization in every department. Often the most unlikely departments, say engineering or water, are the places that, that can see the most benefit from using it. And this is not just about women. It's about understanding all genders, including men, along with other dimensions such as race, ethnicity, age, and others to make the decision, decisions. And lastly, the need to use it is definitely not an indication that organizations or government are not addressing inequity in other ways. It's but one thing of many that can be undertaken. Together we can make our communities better. Governments and institutions have the ability to effect real and lasting change and also make more economical decisions while doing so. We know from looking at many decades of research and work in the community that change happens when we are courageous enough to acknowledge that we aren't there yet and bold enough to take steps to make better decisions. Inequality exists. Different experiences in communities exist. By acknowledging that there are differences, implementing policy tools that can address these differences, we can systematically, systematically change things and create towns, cities, and communities that work for all and we can do so in a way that is both sustainable and economical. I'm sure that we can all agree that that's something that we want. If you are interested in learning more about gender-based analysis, I encourage you to check out the federal government's training and information on this. They have a really comprehensive uh, section on their website that includes online training. Um, you can also contact me at shauna at lukowitz.com or you can find me on Twitter at Shauna Luke. Thanks for your time. Okay, good afternoon. For the first time in 124 years, OJRA is pleased to host an in-depth conversation with those Government of Ontario ministers that have the closest relationship with Ontario municipalities. It will be like a question period at Queen's Park, only better. Please join me in welcoming the Honourable Catherine McGarry, Minister of Transportation, and the Honourable Bill Moreau, Minister of Municipal Affairs. Okay, will you go first, because I'm supposed okay. to sit here. Right. So, far side. I'm going on the far far side. One? You're going the far. far? Go yeah. to the middle one. Oh, Acting as Speaker of the OJRA House for today's proceeding will be our moderator, Scott Butler, <sighs> Manager of Policy Research. 
Thank you. Good to see you. Hey. How are you? Thanks. <laughs> All right. What do we got here? Oh, we got a bunch of stuff. Well, thank you. Um, as Ken alluded to, this is the first time we've done this, so I would ask your indulgence while we try to figure out what we're doing up here. I feel confident in their abilities. It's uh, the far end of this side of the stage that we're really worried about. But that said, um, the intention behind this was to have a, a conversation about those areas where there's some overlap between municipal affairs responsibilities as well as transportation responsibilities. And the, the municipal sector more broadly as well as the province. So um, we've piled, compiled a bunch of questions. We're going to go in through and see, uh, see where the conversation goes. But uh, you know, I I'm, I'm feel that this will be a beneficial, uh, a beneficial exercise for everyone involved. So to begin, I think one of the things that's sort of top of mind right now, um, it's budget day in Ottawa. With regards to your individual mandates, are there things that you're looking for for the feds to announce, provide, are there directions that have been hanging there for a while that you would like to see addressed? Minister? Well, I'm going to leap right in because I want Excellent. to be first at the door, <laughs> as you can imagine. Uh, certainly, if you look at the province of Ontario and the number of infrastructure needs really throughout the province, when we push, pushed pause on our infrastructure spending for a couple of decades, we ended up when we came into office with really an infrastructure deficit across Ontario. So we have been working very hard as a government to try and increase the number of dollars available for infrastructure, whether it's roads, bridges, connecting links, cycling trails, a number of different components of what you, the municipalities, have been asking for us. So my number one ask from the federal government was uh, more infrastructure funding. I know they have uh, provided a package in the last uh, year. I like to be first at the door, knocking to ensure that we can uh, get what we need uh, in Ontario for our infrastructure project. So I'm really hoping to see a fairly robust package uh, from the federal government to, uh, to help us here in Ontario to continue to move forward to, uh, to do some of our infrastructure uh, builds that we need. Sure. Minister Moore, other things? Yeah, I, I would say the same. I think, you know, when I, when I came in in 2003, we, we had identified in 2003 basically three main areas that we felt that there did exist a deficit, uh, financially, infrastructure, and services. And we have been, we feel as a government, investing heavily in infrastructure almost since the very first day that we formed government in 2003. You will have heard the Premier, the Minister of Infrastructure, others talk about how we are now almost to the middle of the largest infrastructure build in the history of the province. We're in the fourth year of a 10 or a 12 year plan, $190 billion spend. I think we're over 10 or 12 years, whatever the time frame is for our program. Having said that, we would often talk publicly about the fact that we felt uh, that we could use a federal partner, that we have one now, but to put it in some context about what Ontario has been doing, the federal government's commitment is 180 billion, I think over eight or 10 years for the country, and Ontario's is 190 billion over the same time frame, more or less, in about, you know, just for Ontario. So we really feel like we've been doing a lot of the heavy lifting. So we're really thrilled now that there is a federal partner uh, at the door, but as Minister McGarry has said, we always feel like there's more that can be done as well. We Tying this back to the municipal sector, if I can give one example, um, um, as the Minister of Municipal Affairs, they announced, uh, the federal government in phase one of their infrastructure spend announced a clean water wastewater fund. Yeah. And it became clear to me very quickly that that fund represented an opportunity for municipalities, but it also represented a challenge. Because many of you may remember that when it was first announced by the federal government, it was announced as a 50% federal 50% municipal project, representing a northern riding with many small northern, northern uh, municipalities in my riding. Many of you come from smaller ridings. It seemed possible to me that many of you would not have been able to afford to tap into that particular program because it was 50% expected. So there was potentially an opportunity missed. So we went back, I worked with the Premier, with the Minister of Infrastructure, mm -hmm. and we ensured that we were able to find 270 million new dollars that we repurposed so that you could then tap into 
infrastructure at the municipal level and not miss out on opportunities. And with the OSIF funding that we provide, some of you may have been able to bring projects forward 100% off of your municipal tax base. So when Catherine talks about infrastructure, I would, I would double down on that and say what we're hoping for from the feds, I think we're going to hear soon about what they're doing with phase two. I know Minister Trelli's been working closely with them. So it, it's a big part of what we do and it's very helpful to us as a province if we've got a significant partner at the table. So the example you just uh, highlighted showed the difficulty with sometimes getting alignment between what's really three orders of government here. Do you have any concern that, we, last year we talked about this notion of project incrementality, right? Where federal and provincial objectives don't necessarily align and it's inconvenient for you. It's a colossal pain in the backside for the folks out here. Do you have any concern that that's bound to repeat itself with the next intake that the feds are about to give for or bring forward? Well, go ahead. I, I would hope not. Um, incrementality was part of the issue that we went through in phase one of the right. federal infrastructure program where our OSIF programs that the money was available to municipalities, many of you had projects that were going to be eligible, but from the federal perspective, when they announced Ferries 1 of their program, the OSIF programs that we had announced were not going to be deemed eligible to be used as funding to tap into the federal money. And, and I believe it was because federally they wanted to show job growth. I think they'd made some commitments to their auditor that their programs were going to yield X. And as a government, we said, well, that's, that's fine. But as a province, we felt like we'd been forward-looking, we'd been proactive, we'd put a lot of money on the table, and we had OSIF programs in many, if not all, of your communities that were already going to be funded, but they were not going to be eligible to be used to tap into that federal infrastructure money. So we worked with them on that point, and, and Minister Trelli was able to get them to amend that and so that that money could be used. So it's our hope that... I think that's the point of your question it on incrementality, is. that we don't go down that road again, and that in phase two, we, we don't find ourselves faced with the same issue that we did in phase one. Right. Did you want to could, add to that? Yeah, if I wanted to add, um, and this comes out of some of the delegations I've had at Roma and also here at the OGRA um, table with the delegations coming forward, some of it, and you'll all agree probably that it's a timing issue, that you might have some funding from the federal government, but uh, they have a deadline where you have to have shovels in the ground. Maybe that's not lining up with the municipal fund that we're trying to put forward. So I found it very helpful from the delegations I've had from some of you in the room in the last couple of days to know what your timing is. You may have new information that assists uh, your application to go up the priority chain, whether it's timing issue or new information about uh, projects that uh, you may have in your municipalities now have the green light to go ahead. So it's very helpful to keep in touch with your ministry about things that have changed in your application, like timing, like a federal deadline. We're endeavoring to work with our uh, federal partners as well as our municipal partners to try and get some of that timing aligned so that if a project's going forward, I've had that in my own municipality where uh, shovels had to be begin on a federal grant and the province wasn't able to, to get there in time to get that part of the grant. So part of it's timing. I always advocate more communication and updating us on your applications, but we are trying to work hard with our federal partners to ensure that we can get some of the timing out of the way so that we can get these projects off the ground for you. So when we talk about get the notion of getting there in time or a collaboration, um, oftentimes where we see this become very tangible and less sort of esoteric is when there's an emergency. Uh, along the Grand River and uh, the Thames River, communities have been affected by flooding. Um, Highlight to me what the process has been like. I'm not asking for cabinet secrets, unless you want to divulge them here, which, I mean, it's perfectly, I'm sure a lot of people would be interested, but um, tell me what the internal conversation's been like about how the province mobilizes its, uh, its, its weight and might to, to respond to those and how they engage with municipalities. Well, it's a, it's a big question, Scott. I mean, and there's nothing secretive about it. We, we have programs that are very public and transparent that are in place and, and have been in place for some time. So yesterday I did a tour of southwestern Ontario. I was in Brantford, uh, Thamesville and, and Chatham. And where we have instances like this, and there's a broader question here I think about carbon reduction and climate change and greenhouse gases and the like, 
But when there is an issue like we have seen in southwestern Ontario, I've been to Windsor twice, I think, in the last 12 or 14 months where they've been severely affected. The province has a process in place. And so what will happen is that of the local MSO, in this case, it's the London office that is closest in proximity and will be the central point of contact for those municipalities. They will send into your communities what's called a PDAT team, Provincial Disaster Assessment Team. They go in and they do the work. Now, generally speaking, they will not go into a community, not ours, but generally speaking, would not go into a community until the floodwaters had receded. Because after all, how can you really assess what has occurred unless you can see the damage that's been left by receding floodwaters? But sometimes it's so apparent that we will activate a program even before the floodwaters have receded. But generally speaking, that's how it will work. The PDAT team will go in, they will do their work, and they will do their assessment, and they will provide a report back to me with a recommendation on whether or not to activate the program. Right. We did that yesterday morning when we were in Brantford. When we were on the ground in Brantford, the program had not yet been activated. The assessment team was close to finalizing their work, and by the time we were in Thamesville or Chatham, uh, they had finished. They'd sent me through an email as we were still on the road. So we activated the program for Brantford last night. And so now homeowners, and this is associated primarily with overland flooding where there is no insurance available, generally speaking for people, that they can at least get some financial assistance so that they can back, get back into their homes that, that they've not been able to live in. So when it deals with only essentials, not a replacement for insurance, and the program's been changed, and I would say, for those of you who are not aware, been ma made very much more responsive so that the money can get out the door quicker into the hands of the people that need it. There's, there used to be only three years ago a local fundraising requirement. That's not necessary anymore. There used to be a local administrative team that had to be set up to administer the claims. We've taken back on that responsibility. So relieving municipalities of those responsibilities, taking it on provincially allows us to get the, the money out the door and for people to get the essentials necessary so they can get back into their homes. Did you want anything, Ms. Minister McGarry? I'm or? going to, from a personal point of view, because uh, my municipality is Cambridge in the Grand Water uh, River, the Grand River watershed. So we were affected in Cambridge by uh, a flooding of the road and some damage along the shoulder, had to close a bridge. We broke a water main. Nothing uh, compared to our direct neighbors to the south in Brantford. And uh, there was a state of emergency, of course, in, in Six Nations. So I was able to lean the whole way across the desk and notify mm -hmm. my, uh, my seatmate here of what was going on there as it was unfolding, and I know that uh, Minister Morrow had already been on the phone with the mayors down there, so had I, but he was ahead of me by, I think, a, f a few minutes. But it was very important that everybody uh, manage to keep their community safe, make sure that the roads or the bridges that were affected uh, had some assessment before they reopened them. I can't uh, praise the conservation authorities uh, highly enough to get some of the wording out, get some of the flood forecasting and warning out, and they kept uh, people safe. So a big shout out there. I know that our team from MTO was on the ground immediately to go out and respond to some of the municipalities. I think they were in Brantford right away to assess some of the structural component of the bridges. Even though they're municipally owned, uh, my ministry will go out and, and do that technical analysis if need be. I, I would add a, a second component to the piece. The, the first part that I was talking about was for homeowners, but there is a second half, and Minister McGarry's been referencing it in her response, for municipal infrastructure. So that part of the program has not been activated in any of the communities yet. That generally takes a little bit longer. I know there's elected officials in the room. There's also a number of you who are engineers and planners in your municipalities. And so for municipal infrastructure, there is a program as well. As a municipality, they are required to have damages that exceed 3% of your own purpose tax revenue to be eligible for the program. And then once that has been achieved, you then become eligible to make an application for help on your infrastructure needs within your own municipality as well. I think the bigger question, and perhaps Scott, you were going there next, you know, I'm not sure, it is what, what do we do longer term, forward looking, the programs I'm talking about are reactive programs, but what do we do as, as planners, as engineers, as elected officials to deal with these issues on a forward looking basis? We always remind people when we're in their communities visiting them that there is uh, a federal program, a national disaster mitigation program. 
It's a $200 million program over five years. It's $40 million per year for the country. You make application as municipalities or conservation authorities to the province, and then we support your applications to the federal government. We've signed off on a number of those. So you're, you're able as municipalities to get some money from a federal program now, but I think we all understand that we need more. You know, the severity and the frequency of the events, I think we would all agree in the room, we're experiencing them more regularly. They're happening more often, and they're more severe when they occur. From 2005, I'll, I'll give you one number, from 2005 to 2010, the programs that I've described in Ontario put out about $8 million to help municipalities in Ontario. And in the next five years, the number jumped to about $180 million. And so, we, as I've mentioned again, I'll say for the, for the last time, the severity and frequency is increasing. So we all need to be forward looking. I, I was talking with some of the mayors that I was with yesterday on the tour and asking them if any of them were, were part of FCM and that maybe that would be a great body that could help us as provinces and territories advocate, advocate to see a, a national program on this as well, because I think we all understand that we're into a new paradigm here now. So you, we've begun, I think, without explicitly acknowledging climate change as the, the, motive, the, the cause behind some of these uh, things. Uh, we've begun talking about it explicitly. Um, what, what's the government doing to respond to climate change from, from I guess, the various perspectives? Transportation is one of the primary uh, emitters in terms of greenhouse gases. Um, municipalities oftentimes are at the front line of feeling the effects. The assets that they manage and, and own are, are often compromised by the severity of these, winter, or these events. Um, tell us a bit about the approach the government's taken um, and why, I guess, that approach has been favored over others. I can lead off on, on that because uh, everyone knows when you see a car going past and they have emissions coming out the, uh, the tailpipe, you know where some of the issues are for climate change. Our government's taken a really strong lead on trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as well as our carbon footprint. So um, not necessarily our file, but closing the coal-fired generation plants took the equivalency of 7 million cars off the road in Ontario and has uh, resulted in savings in our healthcare system uh, to about the tune of $4 billion a year in, in savings in healthcare because of cleanup of air. The transportation system here in Ontario still is one of the big contributors. About 37% of um, our carbon emissions are from our vehicles. We've taken a lead in Ontario on decarbonizing our transportation system. Many of you uh, are aware of some of the electric vehicle uh, models and makes that are on the, uh, on the market today. It's gone from a few models to a lot more. We've had an electric uh, vehicle incentive program in place. We've increased the number of charging stations across the uh, province and continue to roll that out so that more and more people are suffering less from range anxiety and getting into a vehicle that they know they can charge along the way. Even the, uh, the technology is evolving to the point where it's a much quicker charge across the way. Uh, we were oversubscribed to our workplace electric vehicle incentive program, um, and many people are taking advantage of the incentives of, of purchasing an electric vehicle. For the broader range of transportation options, I did an announcement with Metrolinx actually last, last week. We are looking at um, a regional express rail program where we're electrifying our GO rail service. And that's a huge project, one of, the, one of the largest that we're undertaking to try and reduce our carbon footprint and also to be able to provide very quick, reasonable transit options to get more cars off the road. Last week's announcement was kind of exciting. It was called the Hydrail Project. So we're looking at a prototype. We've got a couple of companies coming on stream now to use hydrogen fuel technology that would uh, potentially power our trains to uh, get onto that uh, RER system, the, rail, the uh, electrified rail system. And in that way, we're decarbonizing the area. So there's a number of programs we continue to roll out Cycling would be another uh, aspect. I know many of you are excited by the Ontario Municipal Cycling uh, Strategy that we're rolling out across the province. With the cap and trade proceeds, we have committed about 225 million over a few years, 
and that has resulted in a $93 million program rolled out over about four years to increase the cycling routes in your cities, your towns, and really as a network across the province to get more people out of their cars, onto their bikes, uh, biking to and from where they need to go. So there's a number of things that we're doing. So if the, the, the objective is to, to move people out of emission-producing vehicles and into either transit or cycling. Um, the question, I guess, that comes out is why not, we heard yesterday uh, from some of the economists in the room one of the most effective ways to do that is to begin uh, pricing roads, putting a price on roads. And uh, that's the one surefire way to get people out of vehicles. Um, why did the government uh, decide not to pursue that when the City of Toronto came forward with that as a recommendation? We'll both take a stab at that, but if I could, can I go back to the previous one sure. part a bit too? The, We're not losing this point. Though. When, when, when Catherine, Minister McGarry mentioned earlier, I just wanted to make this point as well uh, about the coal plant closure, talking about climate change and greenhouse gas reductions. It's a point that I, that I like to make from time to time when I have the opportunity. In 2003, going back a few years in that election, all three political parties, all three political leaders in the 2003 election made a very clear commitment to closing coal-fired generation in the province of Ontario. So we had the pleasure of forming government and we met that commitment. Closing coal-fired generation in the province of Ontario represented the reduction of about 6,000 megawatts of energy. Now that's a lot of energy to replace. So I make the point only that when energy prices have been a point of discussion for quite some time across the province of Ontario, that's one of the reasons why energy prices became a bit of an issue, because we made and kept a promise to get out of coal-fired generation. When you replace 6,000 megawatts of energy, there is a cost associated with that. And I just remind folks that it was a commitment that was made by all three parties, and it was made by all three uh, political leaders. To, to the point, um, Scott, about the tolls, I think that, you know, I'm not sure that there was ever really a clear commitment on it. I don't think it works for all municipalities. I think that if the Premier and, and others have spoken on this, their goal is to ensure first. And I think it's a clear position that we've taken as a government that there are as many transit options yeah. in place as is possible before that would become something that would be considered. In response to that, or at least continuing on previous government policies, it doesn't affect everybody in the room, but gas tax funding to help communities with their public transportation networks, understanding that not everybody in the room will get it. But we've made a commitment to double that by 2021, 2022. Currently 170 million a year, uh, sorry, 340 million a year, 170 million I think goes to Toronto, about 340 million a year. By 2021, 2022, the gas tax fund will double to about 640 or 650. So the goal is to continue the massive investments that we've been making in public transit to make sure that people have as many options uh, as they can. I think that would be the position that's been articulated in the past on, on that issue. Okay. Did you want to add anything, Minister McGarry? No, that was exactly okay. what I was going to nope. say, word for word. <laughs> <laughs> Convenient. Um, talking about the, the, the investments in transportation, Move Ontario Forward has received a lot of fanfare. It's a uh, fairly unprecedented investment into transit uh, more broadly in the province. Um, What's the best approach in your, fr from your vantage point as Minister of Municipal Affairs or Minister of Transportation, what's the best approach for municipalities in the province to, to maximize the benefits of this investment? Thank you, and then moving Ontario forward, if I might take a stab at it first, uh, Minister Morrow. Um, the moving Ontario forward has uh, been one of the largest public uh, transit investments really in the history of the province. So generally around 16, mil 16 billion for the city of uh, the GTHA yeah. and 15 billion uh, for those municipalities outside the GTHA. So most municipalities have a fairly well thought out transit option plan uh, combined with things like our community transportation gr grant program that is uh, a fairly new one uh, building on our successful um, 
transportation pilot program allows municipalities the creativity to uh, take advantage of more transit options between inter inter community uh, inter communities that used to be done by bus. We've allowed for that. Most municipalities, as I said, have come up with a good solution, whether it's, a, it's, it's linking of a road, a cycling trail, um, building out uh, some of their infrastructure that allows for uh, their employment lands to be unlocked and, uh, and move forward. So it's, it's really a question of coming to the table with a really well thought out application that can take advantage of as much as they can and also make sure, and I think I've uh, said that to a couple of the municipalities that I was with today, uh, make sure that you haven't left any federal uh, money on the table. Make sure you've sort of done the, the ask to all, all levels. It's always easier to manage funding something with uh, dollars from all levels of government. Is there anything you wanted to add, Ms. Moore? Well, yeah, I'm, I was listening to the question. I'm not quite sure how, how, what's the best way to answer it, but I, I think that I would just add, I think most municipalities are very interested in and are very supportive of the work that, that we've been doing as a government when it comes to enhancing transportation, generally speaking, whether it's in this corridor here that serve, you know, through high-speed rail, go transit, all of that, but even for the more rural municipalities where we have been investing heavily in, in highway infrastructure, I, they know that it's, it's good for their communities, they know that it's safe, but they know I think it helps with economic growth and opportunity. I, I can tell you in Northern Ontario, my hometown is, is Thunder Bay by way of example, when we formed government in 03, the money for highways in Northern Ontario flows from the Ministry of Transportation um, through the Ministry of Nor Northern Development and Mines, what we call a Northern Highway Program. And up to about 2003, the high water mark in any given year for expenditures in Northern Highways, give or take, was about 250 million in any given year. Since coming to government, we have probably averaged north of 500 to as high as 750 million per year. So I'm not sure I'm actually answering your question, Scott. I mean, I, I wasn't sure actually how to answer it, but only to say I think it should, I hope that it's obvious to those in the room and those that aren't, that we have invested massively. We, we understand there is much more work to be done. As the Minister of Municipal Affairs, a lot of the work that we have been doing is planning for the expected population growth that people tell me maybe as many as four million more people by the year 2041. And of course, good transportation networks and good municipal planning and provincial planning are going to be fundamental to being able to accommodate that growth and people living in, in livable communities. So um, I, I guess I would leave it at that. Okay, uh, we brought up high-speed rail, so we'll, let's, let's talk a bit about high-speed rail. Um, High level, give me, the, give me the optimist guide to high-speed rail in Ontario, then we'll ask the negative questions afterwards. Well, I'm very excited, and as are all of us about high-speed rail, this will be the first uh, high-speed rail project in Canada, in Ontario. And phase one will be, uh, you know, eventually when it's built out from Windsor through Toronto. So the first phase of the project we're looking at from Toronto to London, the second phase will be London, Chatham, Windsor. So eventually seven stops from Windsor, Chatham, London, Kitchener, Waterloo, um, Guelph, the airport, and eventually Union Station. So this is a very exciting um, project, cutting the average transportation time from Windsor to Toronto in half. So, you know, Kitchener, Waterloo to downtown Toronto in 48 minutes. So it's an incredibly strong argument being made, business case-wise, that this will help to add jobs and uh, economic development really throughout much of the Southwest. So very, very excited about it. We had uh, the Honourable David Collinette come and advise us. He set up a special advisory committee, did a lot of consultation. We've now uh, proven that the business case is there to, to bring it forward. He has now uh, joined us as chair of the Planning Advisory Board. We are in the process right now of putting together the rest of the appointments for a Planning Advisory Board uh, with representatives from many sectors, including the agricultural sector and the uh, Indigenous uh, First Nations uh, sector. We'll continue to move forward with a lot of consultation uh, through the system uh, in the coming days and months. Looks like the uh, 
environmental assessment, I think uh, Mr. Collinette was telling me, would be approximately 18 months to 24 months in length, and then we will be building out, hopefully by 2024-25, uh, from uh, the London to Toronto leg. So we will continue to keep our municipalities informed. Now that we've just appointed the Honourable David Colinet, he will be reaching out to some of those municipalities that may be affected by this in order to uh, continue the conversations along that way. So the, the, I think that's, we'll call that the optimist guide, right? Uh, Ontario, well, not Ontario, but Canada more broadly, I think has a proud reputation of being a leader in high-speed rail planning, not so much the construction side, but the part of the reason maybe that hasn't come to fruition before is because there's always been concerns that the benefits to, if I'm in Guelph or if I'm in Kitchener-Waterloo are, are fairly tangible, I can get downtown. If the rail's cutting through my community or my property, it seems less tangible. Are there, what's your approach to, to addressing those concerns? As I said, we're at the process now that we are moving ahead with environmental assessment yep. and uh, continuing some of the conversations that were started originally when we were looking to see if the plan was feasible or not, and the plan is feasible and the business case is solid right from Windsor through to Toronto. So for those municipalities that are being affected, I can tell you that in uh, discussions in the last couple of days that we will be uh, ensuring that number one, our representation on the planning advisory board, plus some of the technical parts of it, will have representation from municipalities as well to look at those things. Because this is at the beginning of the process, I don't have a map yet where right. we're looking at a route by any stretch. But from what I can tell from my ministry officials, when they were answering one of the municipalities that came forward, they'll be looking to uh, uh, the alignment where they can to avoid the issue of uh, cutting as many, you know, many properties in half. Certainly, I also come from a, a rural township. My, my neighbors are farmers. I understand that uh, trying to get farm equipment from one side of a road to another can be very challenging. We are certainly aware of that, and we do believe that the process going forward will bring those voices to the table and help to align that route to minimize uh, those properties that are affected. Okay, but I, let's dive down into this a little more. I guess what, I, what I'm really curious about is a lot of these communities um, have prided themselves on having a quality of life that, 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 that capitalizes on all the virtues we associate with rural Ontario. Um, having 200 kilometer hour missiles fly through the middle of the community may run counterintuitive to a lot of those uh, hopes and identities. Um, are, we, are we at risk of having a repeat of some of the criticism we had with the Green Energy Act where we have communities coming forward with uh, unwilling hosts or unwilling thoroughfares for high speed rail? I know that when you're planning any large infrastructure project, whether it be a highway build, you know, think of recently, uh, an example would be the 407 highway. Mm -hmm. There's a number of big infrastructure projects that we as a province need to ensure is there in order to be able to uh, build that economic growth and opportunity for all. We have heard from a long period of time that the Southwest needs more infrastructure to be able to attract more businesses. I'll give you one quick example from a municipality I was talking to. So if you have a high tech kind of job that you're trying to at attract um, uh, somebody that's very skilled in that opportunity who is uh, partnered with somebody else that can't find a job in that municipality but has found something in, let's say, Kitchener-Waterloo, the high-speed rail in between those communities would allow them to live in one and work in the other with a, with a minimum of um, transportation between the two. So it's there as assisting the Southwest in particular to drive the economy forward and have more options for people to get from uh, Windsor through Toronto and take some of the traffic off the road. Um, we all know that the 401, for instance, is our major trucking route from one end of the province through the other. We need to ensure that people are, are, are having options to get off that, that highway and uh, ensure that we can get things to and from in a timely way. So I'm going to deviate just slightly and use my moderator's prerogative to capitalize on the fact that I have uh, Minister Morrow from Thunder Bay as well as the former Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry here and say, 
that we've talked a lot about southwestern Ontario and this sort of significant investment that's, that's poised to happen there. The Ring of Fire is a similar opportunity in, in northwestern Ontario. Um, give me an update on where that is. Uh, there's certainly been a number of announcements um, from the perspective of folks in this room, though there doesn't seem to be a lot of action. I will, you know, take the point that things have not moved forward as fast as people would have liked them to. Um, I think there was a very clear commitment from the government from the early days that they would do this as best they were able, mm -hmm. uh, hand in hand with First Nation communities. We had a great announcement in Thunder Bay in August of this year, uh, where the Premier was in Thunder Bay, and we announced, in fact, that we had an agreement on a road corridor. Um, the environmental assessment associated with that announcement is to begin, if it hasn't already begun, is, is to begin any day now, uh, or any time now, I know that Noront, the principal uh, mining company in that jurisdiction, is very excited and, and very uh, enamored with the announcement. They were there at the announcement. They've spoken very positively about this. And so I would have to answer by saying, I think we're where we've been trying to get to for quite some time. Okay. Um, more work to be done, but you raise a great point. This represents a multi-generational economic opportunity for Northern Ontario, and it will be impactful for the entire province. It's that large. And um, so we're very excited about it. We're, we're there now, and as I mentioned, so uh, the Premier was in Thunder Bay and she's announced that the road quarter, that is the key to moving the project forward. The environmental assessment should start at any time. Okay, did you want to add anything? And I, and I could, certainly with my former hat as a natural resources and forestry, I sat on the, the minister's table uh, about the Ring of Fire, and we've been continuing to work with our First Nation community. And as Minister Morrow have referenced, <coughs> This was a project that went through many uh, treaty areas and we felt very strongly in the spirit of reconciliation in the province, which the province has committed to, that we needed to ensure that our First Nations partners were, were ready and willing and able to, to participate in the economic benefits of, of uh, that area as well. So I think as Minister Morrow has referenced, it's an incredibly complex project. This is through areas where there are no roads, bridges, or infrastructure yet. So starting the project is really trying to get that road alignment first and foremost, getting some of the permitting done that has to be done along that way, and that includes uh, many aggregate pits in order to be able to, re to build the road. So we're continuing to work forward. There's a number of people in our ministries that are continuing to work towards this. We're certainly, uh, as Minister Morrow said, just poised now on the edge of finally getting shovels in the ground, getting that route established, getting the energy lines along there, and getting that project uh, started. A point I would make on that as well, Scott, is that you know usually from the establishment of a fine to an actual operating mine, yeah. um, 10 years is not an unrealistic number. So they, they do not happen quickly. And as Minister McGarry has referenced, the Ministry of Mines actually has less to do with the opening of a mine than multiple other ministries do. There's a variety of permitting that's necessary from a multiple number of other ministries. And so they're very complex. And so all of them uh, take probably longer than, than we wish they would. Yeah, municipalities are used to municipal, or ministries taking their time and taking slightly longer than uh, we hope for on certain yeah. issues, but yeah. we get the point. Um, road safety, uh, there's been a lot of stuff. Quite frankly, how people use roads is changing. What we, their expectations are of what, how they think of roads, how they use it, how they move about on them is changing. This has placed a lot of uh, pressure on rethinking how we're going to continue our reputation as, are we second or top? Yeah, we're usually first or second in road safety across Sa North safety America in the last yes. 10 years, if anyone's keeping track, which so, obviously Scott is. Yeah, but so um, how do we protect that? What are, what are the steps that are taking? What's left to be done? Thank you very much for the question. And um, little known fact, maybe, but I was parliamentary assistant for the then Minister of Transportation, Minister Del Duca, for the first two years I was elected. And one of the first tasks I had was taking the, uh, the legislation forward, making Ontario Road Safer Act. So that included safety measures such as distracted driving, 
drug-impaired driving. We put in measures to uh, look at some of our vulnerable road users. There were uh, pieces of legislation to protect cyclists, uh, increased fine and demerit points for dooring, opening a door in front of a cyclist, one meter safe passing. Um, yeah. We had uh, instituted uh, fines and demerit points for distracted driving, which has become actually one of the most serious issues on the road. Just talk to any law enforcement officer or any insurance company and they realize that this is now uh, causing more fatalities and more accidents almost than alcohol related incidents. So we continue to look at how people are changing their, their driving patterns. If you think back 30 years ago, how many people in the room had a cell phone? So we're trying to update some of our legislation as things change. As we're continuing to add more and more people in Ontario, as some of our uh, driving uh, has changed, um, there are more technologies there to help keep the, the driver safe. We're looking at autonomous vehicles, driver assist technology, the, the, uh, the lane nudger that's bringing it back in, some of the early warning systems to break. That technology in our vehicles is changing. But legislatively, we felt that we needed to do more. So in December, we brought through more legislation to even increase the fines for distracted driving from just, a, a, I think it was a $465 for, for a fine at that point, give or take, uh, and three demerit points to an escalating system. So the first offense is this much. We've increased the fines, increased the demerit points looking at um, drug-impaired driving, doing the same kind of thing there, uh, ensuring that uh, we have addressed some of the issues that our law enforcement officers were telling us. So careless causing death, for instance. So mm -hmm. at one time, careless driving, if a driver had uh, been convicted of uh, careless driving, the, the, the fines did not really look at what the, the issue or the, the impact was of that particular collision. So in December, and that will be uh, about a year till it's proclaimed once we have the IT sector up, but we have increased the fines for those that have been um, convicted of um, careless driving to uh, be far greater penalties, both financial, license suspensions, sometimes jail time, and we've upped those penalties to do that. I always say too that many people are trying to um, change the infrastructure on their roads to try and reduce the number of accidents or serious accidents in the province. And I always add the caveat that we want to have fewer people in our emergency departments that are there because of motor vehicle collisions and that rests with the driver. 93% of collisions on our roads are due to human error. That's where autonomous vehicle technology may assist us with that, but people need to pay attention, follow the rules, uh, drive according to the weather, all the things that our road safety partners are doing. So we're continuing legislatively to ask to answer that piece about um, penalties. We're also continuing to uh, work very closely with our, our road safety partners to ensure that those campaigns are heard with people. The put down your phone, it only takes seconds. There's a number of campaigns recently. We're trying to get that message across. It, it costs us all, it costs the municipalities, costs the people, and bottom line is, we want our, our family members and ourselves to be able to use the roads and go home at the end of the day safely. Fair enough. Um, we're getting up towards the uh, end of the time on this session. Um, you probably heard there's an election coming up. Um, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. There's two of them, actually. A lot of people here are concerned yes. about the second one. Um, in 30 seconds, give me the case for uh, the liberal, uh, liberal government getting a mandate in June from the municipal affairs perspective. Hmm. 30 seconds or 30 less? 30 seconds. Or less, yeah. We like efficiency. From a municipal affairs perspective, I, well, I, I could do it by comparison, and I, I apologize up front if this sounds a bit partisan, but one of the reasons that I ran provincially, and I think a number of us that came in in 03, a number, uh, the reason a number of the others ran in 03 was we were municipal councillors in our ridings uh, from 95 to 2003, and I would suggest to you from the perspective of municipal affairs that the relationship that existed between 
95 and 03, and I was a counselor for six of those years, and I would hope it's understood and experienced that the relationships that existed from 03 to, to 2017 is very, very different. I had first-hand experience with both, and it's my belief that we have been very responsive and understanding to the needs of the municipal sector. Almost 30 seconds. <laughs> From a transportation perspective, if you think back to uh, the 1990s when um, the government of the day downloaded much of the responsibility for roads and municipal infrastructure to the municipalities without the corresponding dollars to be able to look after them and, and maintain them was devastating to many of your municipal budgets because you were needing to put up your municipal taxes to be able to pay for it. And we're still, because of that infrastructure pause that I talked about earlier, uh, still trying to resolve some of that infrastructure deficit with our roads, bridges, connecting links, and everything else. So from my perspective, we have had and continue to have record investments in infrastructure, in our road building, in our transit options, in our transportation corridors, our cycling and our road safety. I think from a transportation perspective, nobody has done more in the, in the last few years as, as we have. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, this brings us to the end of the session. I want to extend my gratitude to each of you for taking time out of your busy schedules, um, to time away from delegations to join us. Um, this has been good. I think uh, I'm hopeful that people in the audience feel the same way. And please join me in a round of applause for Minister Moran. Minister Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Very good, thanks. Apparently, I'm closing the session. Uh, we're back in here this evening for the OGRA social. It's 80s night, so feather your hair and put on some fluorescent clothes, and we'll see you back here at 7, or 7 p.m., hopefully not a.m., and uh, this concludes today's session. Thank you very much.